Hello, everyone. I am Zhi Qiangzhou, a contributor of Chaos Mesh. I will bring the Chaos Mesh technical updates for you. Uh, the first part is the new features and enhancements. Uh, it's almost three months since the last community meeting. We have built it up many enhancements and features for Chaos Mesh. Now I will introduce the first three features for all of them. Uh, here is the brand new Chaos dashboard. It's much cleaner and efficient than the last version. It even contains a little tutorial, takes you familiar with the basic operation of the dashboard. And then thanks to our contributor, uh, this one. <laughs> Uh, he built the chaos control for profiling chaos during chaos experiment. It's just like uh, the Kubi control for Kubernetes. It could look up what chaos daemon exactly does on your workload. If you want to figure out how chaos mesh, the, how chaos daemon works, it's a great tool. Uh, when we profiling or debugging, chaos control could save tons of time. For example, reducing the complex steps for fetching IP tables rules, just like only typing chaos control debug network chaos. And DNS chaos is a new type of chaos that we supported. It, it hijacking the DNS request return server failure or random IP for the DNS request. You could also create DNS chaos on the dashboard. Now, uh, next part is version released. We have released the 1.1.1 at January 21st. This version includes all the new features that I mentioned previously. And there are no breaking changes between 1.0 and 1.1. You could just upgrade your chaos mesh from 1.0 to 1.1 to try new features. Uh, we're using x.y.z style version. For now, increasing Z means bug fixing, bug fixing. Increase, increasing Y means new features. Increasing Z means big, big updates, refactoring, refactoring or something breaking changes. We will release a Y version monthly. Uh, the last part is the up, upcoming plans. Uh, there are some works that, that we are focusing on. First, more chaos. Uh, thanks to our contributor, Galadot, uh, he built the GVM chaos. It's almost completed. After that, Chaos Mesh could inject chaos, chaos into Java applications, simulation virus chaos like uh, OOM, uh, slow functions, and through in customized exceptions. And we are building HTTP chaos as a transparent proxy. It could hijacking HTTP request and the response, uh, make changes on it or delay for a while. Uh, at last, chaos is uh, the AWS chaos. It allows uh, chaos mesh inject chaos based on your AWS, uh, such as shut down or restart your ECS and detach uh, EBS. Uh, one big point of our works is bug fixing, stati stability, and uh, compatibility. As we know, Chaos Mesh controls the blast radius based on the container, and most of cloud providers often have a customized uh, Linux kernel. We are testing uh, Chaos Mesh on some clouds hosted uh, uh, on some uh, cloud hosted Kubernetes, such as EKS and GKE. Uh, we are still in which the list of cloud providers that Chaos Mesh could play well. Uh, another point is Chaos Mesh workflow. It brings the orchestration of the chaos. This is still under designing. We make an RFC and design documents in one PR, like this, PR 4080. Uh, so welcome comments and uh, suggestions. Uh, finally, we are writing some documents about how to deploy Chaos Mesh and the air-gapped server. I think we could see it in the next weeks. Oh, that's all. Uh, that's all the technical updates. Next up is community updates. Hi, Mila. 
Okay. Uh, I will share my screen now. So it's been about three months since we've last caught up. So I thought I'd give you a little catch up uh, about what we've been up to. So Chaos Mesh celebrated its first year since open source uh, back on December 31st, 2020. So we prepared a little gift bag for our contributors and adopters. And we thought it was also the perfect opportunity to conduct a community survey to hear back from the community to see like what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, which we should improve upon. And um, from what we've gathered so far, we should improve our upon our documentation and we should be more open in terms of uh, decision-making and uh, our project moving forward. So we started using GitHub discussions and we have also started adopting Chaos Mesh governance which is my next point. But first, let me introduce you to our new community partners, SIG Stability. And uh, I think they'll be talking about it a bit later. But back to the community governance, it is now live, but it's still a work in progress and we will be updating it as we see fit. Uh, we've also come up with a community growth pass, which starts with Chaos Mesh users, they usually have a need for our community and they can be evangelizing about Chaos Mesh, writing documents, documentations, or just simply telling people about Chaos Mesh. And then we have the contributors, which are uh, who are people that have at least submitted one PR to our GitHub repo. And then we have the committers, they're the core um, they're not, they are the newest addition to our community growth path. They usually have an active and ongoing engagement with the community and as, as well as the project itself. And then we have the core, core of a project, our maintainers. They have the final say and they are the co-owners of this project. So the goal of the community governance is that we want to make it clear how to contribute and how to participate in the decision-making process uh, of Chaos Mesh. And so that you guys have a source sense of a recognition and um, have a belonging in this community. And we have also published a few blogs since October, which is a good mixture of English and Chinese blogs and technical and non-technical. And we've also got a few blogs from our uh, community evangelists, Zhang Hui and Manish. And we hope we can keep it up in the future. Also from the TIDB hackathon that ended just a few weeks ago, we found a few projects that could improve the chaos engineering ecosystem and their TIE improve, which tests TIDB with AWS infrastructure and triggers chaos mesh by Lambda function, CAAS, Chaos Engineering as a Service and Collide Domain, which stimulates cloud service failure and supports critical chaos. These are projects that could potentially be uh, landed and come into real life in the near future. So let's see what happens. And I think that's basically it. Got any more questions? You can follow us on our social media or ask questions on the Slack. So, and that's it. Thank you. And Kevin, do you want to take over? Yes. Um, uh, yeah, thanks to Chan Mila for the sharing of this um, film, uh, the updates for these three months. It's really exciting. Uh, do we have any questions so far? Oh, um, if you uh, haven't thought of something, we can um, hand over to the heart now for the exciting sharing of, from RabbitMQ. Your heart. Thank you very much. Uh, I found those you. updates super useful. Thank you, Mila. Yeah. I just completed your community survey. Ooh, that was great. Nice. Thank you. You will get Thanks. a community pack in the new future. Yeah. 
thank you. I just wanted to make sure that you have more information from your users. That was that was my focus, but yes. So thank you for mentioning that. I didn't, I didn't even know about that. So found it on Twitter, really simple. If anyone here hasn't done it, I recommend that you do. Or if you're watching this and you haven't done it, it's super simple. It took me two minutes. It is. And it was great fun. Okay, I'm thank going to share you. my screen now. You're welcome. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yep. Okay. So I was just going to be honest with you. I was just going to rock up as in turn up and just talk. But Connor told me yesterday, hey, are we going to prepare some slides? And I said, no, I was just going to show up and talk. And then I thought about like, yes, why don't we prepare some slides? So that's what I did. Well, what I did. So this is Connor's fault. The reason why we have slides. Uh, you'll tell me at the end if they were worth it. So uh, this is how everything started. This is uh, TJR season one, episode nine. It's the last season, it's the last episode for season one. Uh, this is a series of video episodes that the Rabbit MQ team produces uh, and we touch on specific topics. In this case, we were touching on testing resiliency and how one may do that using Chaos Mesh. I didn't know anything about Chaos Mesh before we tried it. And I was really impressed of with everything, documentation, how it worked, the dashboard, there was so much good stuff. So um, to be honest, most of the work, Connor did the work. Um, he came up with the idea, he found it, and uh, I just joined and I was really, really uh, impressed. So if you wanna see this episode and you haven't, if you go to tgi.rabbitmq.com, you'll see a list of shows, a list of episodes. Uh, it's a YouTube playlist, the top one, uh, episode nine, that's the one where you can watch us do chaos mesh things. It's great fun. Okay. Uh, the first thing which I would like to say to all of you, all the maintainers, is thank you for making chaos easy. And chaos should not be easy, right? It should be really difficult, but you're making it easy. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Uh, even though Connor couldn't join us, I made sure that uh, we have a couple of things from him. So the first thing which Connor said is that the framework is awesome and he cannot believe that it's only recently gone GA. It's super effective. So for GA projects, wow, there's just so much there and it works so well. The next thing which Connor had to say is that defining experiments as CRDs makes it really easy to integrate with our workflow, with the RabbitMQ workflow. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes, yep, I can. We can hear you. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Just double checking. I shouldn't be quiet, but if I am, let me know. Yeah, you're a bit a bit too quiet. All right. Give me one minute. Sure. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Is this yes, better? Now it's perfect. Great. Yes, I would have been I would have been very disappointed to have talked for like 10 minutes. <laughs> Nobody told me that you can't hear me. That would have been very disappointing. So how far back should I go? Let me know. Actually, I don't think you need to go back. Okay. Just, just, continue. just, just now it was just a little bit quiet, but we can okay. hear you. Yeah. And this is good now. Perfect. Yeah. So I'll continue. So defining experiments as CRDs makes it really easy to integrate with our workflow. Also Connor thing, um, I was pleasantly surprised by the CRDs that you have. I mean, that was great. I wasn't expecting that. Well done for that. Um, another Connor thing, and I completely agree with it, is that the dashboard is a great abstraction, especially the experiments timeline. And I think we're using the previous dashboard. 
So I'm looking forward to trying out the new one. And we also want to try the Grafana integration next, which we haven't done. But I know that you have that. It looks great. We can hardly wait to try it out. There is a longer one from Connor here. I will let you read it. If you have any questions, ask me. I'll give you 10 seconds. Okay, mm -hmm. so there's quite a bit of text there. If you want, I can go into more detail or I can skip and we can come back to this later. Any preferences? Yeah, I think you can just go a little bit into the details. Okay. So what I remember from this specific experiment is that we cannot dynamically choose a source. So in this case, once we select a source, it's, uh, it's static. So it's always the same one. So we couldn't say pick a source randomly. So the, the configuration is fairly static. And then we couldn't say randomly pick a source and then the other two nodes pick them as destination. It is always the same one. Okay, I know there's quite a bit, lot of detail here and we can come back to this later. It would, I think it would help to have Connor here as well, uh, since you know one of you will ask a question and say, I don't know what Connor meant by that. That's, that's what I assume that he meant by that. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit about RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ, most of you are already familiar with it. Um, RabbitMQ in a nutshell is a distributed stateful system. And it has been around for quite a bit of time since 2007, that's when it first shipped. This in a, in a way predates the cloud. So forget containers, forget Kubernetes, this predates the cloud. And things were very different way back then. We had bare metal machines. They were like the norm. Virtualization was still like the, what is that thing? It's just too modern. I'll stick to my bare metal machines. And things were a lot more static that time. Things have changed significantly. And there's certain um, challenges that RabbitMQ has to solve around environments which are highly fluid and highly dynamic, which is what happens in the cloud, especially with containers, right? They take milliseconds to come up and then disappear and things change all the time. So there's quite a lot of chaos naturally in a, a Kubernetes cluster, for example, or even like a container runtime, it doesn't have to be a Kubernetes cluster. And RabbitMQ has to work extra hard these days to make up for that fluidity. We can come back to this later if you want. However, the ambition, our ambition, the RabbitMQ team's ambition is to make Kubernetes the best platform for running RabbitMQ. It has so many advantages and this is before I even get started with Chaos Mesh. Having projects such as Chaos Mesh, part of this cloud native landscape is amazing. And if we run on Kubernetes natively, well, guess what? We can integrate with everybody, but I'm spoiling the fun a little bit. So how do we do that? How do we make Kubernetes the best way to run RabbitMQ? Well, the first thing we thought, how about we experiment with the different players in the ecosystem we try and integrate with a few. And Chaos Mesh is one such example. So even though we knew nothing about Chaos Mesh about maybe four to five months ago, or we may have heard of it, but never really tried it, we tried to play with it. How does it work? How does it help us? And we were pleasantly surprised with what we found. So well done, Chaos Mesh. First of all, for going open source. Second of all, for investing so much attention, hard work, um, dedication to a project that I think everybody needs, not just RabbitMQ, but especially RabbitMQ. Now I can, again, I can cover that as well later. We also, as cloud native citizens, would like to learn from others. And custom CRDs, it's something that we haven't thought about, but we keep seeing other projects such as Chaos Mesh using them, and we can see how useful it is. So wouldn't it be nice if you didn't use to have, if you didn't need to use the RabbitMQ API or the client, the HTTP API, doesn't matter how or which API you want to use, 
for defining objects such as queues or users or bindings. Wouldn't it be great if there were custom CRDs for that? So that's something that we're thinking about. We do have a few experiments, uh, but yes, I mean, we've seen this firsthand as, at Chaos Mesh and it was really nice. It was a great, it was great uh, to be an end user of that feature. The next thing is to give back. So season one, episode nine, that video was us giving back to how we worked with Chaos Mesh. How did it integrate with RabbitMQ? What did we like? What didn't we like? What was great? And we also shared all of that. So all the code, uh, all the YAML, all the invocations, all of that stuff, it's public. Anybody can use it. And then this chat, right? Joining your community, speaking about our uh, experience, uh, answering any of your questions. Uh, yeah, that's another way of how to give back. But what I would like to know is what would you like to know? So I gave like a very brief overview, many different opportunities to ask me questions, uh, or you can ask me new questions, it's okay. What I would like to know is what you would like to know. So who'd like to go first? So do we have any questions for Kahat? I have a question. The sure. most uh, uh, useful chaos is what kind of chaos? Um, it means how, uh, which kind of bugs you can find by each kind of chaos? Um, so I think that what you're asking is what type of chaos we are finding most useful or what type of chaos we've used? Is that, is that, was that your question? Uh, yes, yes, you're right. Okay, so the most useful chaos was the network chaos for us. And uh, the network latency was very useful because um, a RabbitMQ cluster is a, a complete graph. What that means is that every node is connected to every other node. And if one of the connections is slow, it tends to affect the entire cluster. This is especially true for what we call classic mirrored queues. Um, they have, um, you know what, I'm not going to go into too many details, but network is the most useful chaos type for us. Well, thank you. I can tell you more if you want. Oh, you just have to ask. Um, did you try network partition? We found many bugs by network partition in TiDB. Yes. Yes, is the answer. So um, my and our initial recommendation for a production-ready RabbitMQ cluster was to use um, a, part a network partition mode that RabbitMQ supports uh, natively called Ignore. So by default, RabbitMQ nodes, they won't take any action when they detect network partition in the cluster. And we thought, well, doing nothing is the safest way of not losing data. Because uh, there are three network partition handling strategies in RabbitMQ. The first one is ignore, which is enabled by default. The second one is pause minority, which means when the nodes, the, the nodes which are in the minority, they will stop themselves so they won't run. And there's also auto heal. Auto heal heals, again, they also stop themselves, but they heal the partition, uh, let me remember when they reconnect or when they disconnect. I, I, can't, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's basically when they discard data. So the winning side basically, as the losing side resets itself. And that's when you can lose data. It doesn't matter when the network partition kicks in. Um, by using Chaos Mesh, we discovered that using pause my uh, using ignore, which should be the safest one, is actually the worst one. And the reason why it's the worst is because nodes that are not part of the cluster would be in the service. They would remain in the service because the redness probes would be okay. And because the redness probes are okay, you'd be sending traffic to nodes that are no longer part of the cluster. 
I mean, they're there, they can service, but they can't, they are not sharing the cluster's state. So the one thing which we did as a result of using Chaos Mesh is to go back on the initial recommendation and say, don't use ignore, even though you may lose data, use pause minority. Because in Kubernetes, the way everything is set up, it's the better uh, network partition handling strategy for RabbitMQ. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hi. I also Hi. have a question. Sure. Oh, uh, I, I want to know how to check your uh, RabbitMQ, the health state, um, because uh, how to check your uh, application data is a very important um, important for Kelsey and Neary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how to check the state of RabbitMQ, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so as you know, with from distributed systems, it's really uh, it's really difficult to say if everything is okay. Uh, mm -hmm. or if it's healthy, because it depends healthy based on which perspective. So two nodes could be connected and they could be healthy, but a third node may only be connected to one node, one of the two mm -hmm. nodes. So are you healthy? Well, you are, you're like in a degraded state, but you're not fully healthy. So the simplest thing is to look at a node level. Is the node healthy? And a healthy node RabbitMQ, I need to give you a little bit of background. RabbitMQ is an application that runs inside the Erlang VM. So the system process that you see running in a pod is actually the Erlang VM. And even though the process is running, RabbitMQ, which is one of the applications inside of the Erlang VM, may not be running. Oh. Now you think, right, that's like the first, wow, what? So <laughs> RabbitMQ is one of the many applications which runs. We have applications, for example, which are responsible for persisting data to disk or replicating. Uh, we have different types of queues. So there is, for example, a quorum queue, which has a completely different types of processes which are running inside of the airline VM. They're linked to the RabbitMQ application, but they're independent. A V also has a different process. Um, you have the message stores. There's like so many things. It's it's. It's almost like a set of microservices in a single system process. Erlang, it's been around for four decades now, three, four decades, and microservices is not a new term. Erlang has been using it for decades now. Um, and what that means is that while Rabbit could be not running, the Erlang VM may be running. So your readiness probe, which um, if you use the cluster operator, for example, to get RabbitMQ, it will check, uh, the it will do TCP health checks. Is the AMQP port listening? Is there a listener on the AMQP port? And what that means is that the RabbitMQ application is running. And that's oh. an important, that is an important detail. If Rabbit is running, it means that it can, it can accept AMQP connections. And by the way, you know, RabbitMQ has many different plugins and it supports many different protocols. So while you can enable or disable the management plugin, which opens the uh, HTTP port 15672. There's no plugin that you can disable to not listen on NQP. So the NQP port, uh, this is not 91, there's NQP 1.0 as well, which is using a different port, by the way. NQP not 91 will always be listening if the RabbitMQ app is healthy. Right. So we know the airline VM is running, we know the Rabbit app is running, right? So things are good. Well, yeah. It continues. Oh, I, Would you like me yeah. to continue? Uh, yeah, um, because what we want to um, make make sure um, can you can user can use chaos match to check the application status by uh, our chaos match, but it's a very difficult problem for us. So I I, I want to know uh, RabbitMQ um, have some common common solution to check the state, uh, the application yes. status, such mm -hmm. as uh, um, if you have uh, um, uh, such as uh, like uh, EDC um, Redis, we have a, mm -hmm. a, a, a HTTP port and a health, uh, we can we can access the uh, HTTP to get the status of the uh, Redis. Mm -hmm. On RabbitMQ, we have we have this uh, this this way to get the status. 
okay? So RabbitMQ, the equivalent of that in the RabbitMQ world is the aliveness check or the aliveness test. You make an HTTP call, you need to have the management uh, plugin running. You make an HTTP call to port 15672. API, I think a liveness check or something like that. Uh, I forget the exact route. And what that does behind the scenes, it creates a queue, it publishes a message, and it consumes mm -hmm. a message. So that's what will determine whether the node is alive and healthy, or it can do the basic operations. Now, okay. RabbitMQ, as you know, you have many different types of queues in it. So you have the classic queues, you have the quorum queues, and there's another type of queue, which is they're like streams. They're not really queues. So imagine when you have these, uh, and they're, by the way, they're independent. So yes, they're running on like the same app, but they're all independent. So some of those queues, for example, they may be backing up. Is RabbitMQ healthy? It is, but the queue isn't healthy. Oh. What if, for example, you start triggering the memory alarm? RabbitMQ has two types of alarm, well, actually a few more, but two important ones, the memory or disk. It's either, it either has approached the low disk threshold or the high memory alarm has been triggered. Hmm. In that case, either, either alarms, when they're triggered, uh, all publishing of messages stops. So in that case, the node is not healthy, right? Oh. And then a bunch of things happens behind the scenes to rabbit will try to make itself healthy if it can. For a disk, it's a bit more difficult. For memory, it can try to garbage collect and it does more aggressively when, when, when that happens. Oh, okay, I got in. Such as KDB, we also have very, very matrix on um, Grafana to show the status of the application. Right. Yeah, and, uh, right. and also when we do the Kelsey experiment on TDB, uh, we also check the uh, matrix on Grafana to to, yes. to, make sh to check the status. Maybe mm -hmm. RabbitMQ is also do it. Uh, I, really also. Like, I really like that you mentioned this, and this is very, very important. So yeah. RabbitMQ yeah. supports Prometheus natively. <laughs> what that means yeah. is that you enable a plugin, it can get Prometheus metrics, right? And that's great. So you don't yeah. have to have any Prometheus exporter, nothing like that. Port 15692. That's the Prometheus port. So that's the first step, right? We have Grafana dashboards, a lot of them. So if you go to grafana.org, um, grafana.com, orgs, RabbitMQ, you can see all the dashboards. RabbitMQ.com forward slash Prometheus HTML. That's where you have all the Prometheus and Grafana integrations, explanations, so on and so forth. But metrics are not enough. You need more. Mm, so this yeah. year, what we would like to do is not only start shipping logs to Loki and build dashboards, which are using Loki logs with queries, mm. LogQL, all that good stuff. We also want to expose events. RabbitMQ has events, a lot of them, that people don't even know they exist. So we would like to start shipping events to Loki as well. High cardinality, Grafana, uh, Prometheus is not good for that type of thing. Once we have these extra insights into RabbitMQ, we bring out alerts. We're thinking alert manager. Mm. So alerts that, again, we maintain, we write for different rules. Once we have these sets of uh, like uh, these basics, then you can okay. use them to understand what is the state of the system. Yeah, and um, maybe we in the future in the mm -hmm. uh, we maybe use the alarm manager in our chaos match and use this to uh, to set some uh, warning rulers for users. I would really like to see that. I would like to see more about that. Excuse me. Actually, that was going to be my next point. What okay. I was thinking while I was listening to you talk, not, not, not you, like this whole talk, I was thinking, does RabbitMQ chaos make sense? Just as you have DNS chaos and AWS chaos and a few others I can't remember, I think Milat was in your presentation, right? Was it Milat or was it someone else's presentation? Anyways, in this meeting, yeah. part of this meeting, part of this community meeting, someone presented uh, AWS Yeah, I think, I think it's uh, in Zhichang's technical updates. 
Right. He yes, you're right. Mentioned yes. something okay. like AWS Chaos, right? Yes. And that made me think, would it make sense for RabbitMQ Chaos to exist? We wouldn't know where to start, would maybe look at one of the existing ones, but I think it would be really exciting to have a better integration between Chaos Mesh and RabbitMQ. Because do you know what we do to test Chaos in Rabbit? We use Jepson tests, and they're great. They're really good. They catch up a lot of things. We also had some TLA plus specs written for RabbitMQ, which also caught a lot of things. But wouldn't it be nice if regular humans could run this stuff and just could eyeball it and see what the problem is? And I think Chaos Mesh enables that type of um, experimentation. It's easy. It's easy and uh, we can package it in a way that people can understand without too much cognitive load. So what, what do you think about that? Oh, well, I think if you treat Rabbit MQ as a infrastructure, I think it's use, very useful. Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad that you're excited. <laughs> <laughs> Where would we start with that? So what I mean by that, let's say that we would like to build RabbitMQ Chaos. What would be the first step? Would we look at an existing implementation like DNS Chaos? Is there um, a simple one to look at maybe? Is there some documentation that we can start with? Well, we have a repo called RFC. <laughs> so RFC. RFC. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, so uh, actually I do not uh, how to, uh, I don't know. I do not know what can Rabbit MQ Chaos does. So, um, mm -hmm. what do we really need? Okay. So, so <laughs> the sort of things that Rabbit MQ Chaos would do, I can give you a few examples. For example, we would kill queue leaders. So inside Erlang, uh, we have processes, Erlang processes, and they all correspond to specific things. For example, channels, connections queues, v hosts, and the list goes on. But these are the important ones, message stores, very important. So Rabbit Chaos, Rabbit and Chaos would kill these types of very important processes and see how the system reacts. What do you think about that? I think of this as a like a chaos mesh plus uh, test cases for Rabbit MQ. Okay. Right. They're 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 um, kind of packed together as a mm -hmm. use case. Oh, uh, I okay. think maybe we uh, we 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 can support the plugin. Uh, mm -hmm. The user can use the plugin to design the chaos for any uh, uh, any different applic applications such as Rabbit MQ. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also we 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 can we we are de designing the plugin in Chaos Match. Maybe it's very useful for 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 your uh, for your case. I think I think that would be the case because um, TIDB. You mentioned TIDB. Do you have a Chaos toolkit for TIDB using Chaos Match? Does that thing exist? Mm. For so for example. If, yeah, if you were, for example, to kill replication, right? I imagine you must have some sort of replication. So how does we the system a, behave if you kill replication? Uh, we have uh, uh, something beyond the uh, chaos machine, such as a KLPD leader. Okay. TI, do you say TIKV reader? Uh, no, no, no. There is a PD. Like, yeah. PD. Yeah. Yes. In PD is a um, placement driver. Or transfer data from PD. Mm -hmm. PD is a. Yes. PD. Uh, okay, you, like placement yeah. driver. Someone yes, said yes, placement you, driver. You, you, you can say the, uh, in PD, you can, uh, you can make the uh, ETCD cluster. Yes, mm -hmm. and PD use the ETCD, so so we we also test it um, to kill the ETCD leader in PD. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. They, or maybe this and this is the same to your case to to your things. Okay. 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 That makes sense. I'll check it out. Thank you. Um, but now it's not in Chaos Mesh. We we implement it in other ways. <laughs> uh, we want to implement it as a plugin for Chaos Mesh, but uh, now it's not. But now it's not. Uh, it's not in it. Okay. Okay. So how do you test uh, uh, TIDB with Chaos Mesh? What sort of chaos oh. events do you throw at it? We build something system. Um, we use chaos mesh to do chaos and uh, other kinds of uh, applications such as a bank that transfer money from one account to another account and mm -hmm. uh, Jepson to verify the transaction. Jepson, when, okay. When do, yes, when do this verify we do chaos? Mm -hmm. Was that the question? How do we verify with Jepson tests? Is um, that what you asked? Um, we we implement uh, uh, we implement uh, Jepson by Golang, and uh, we verify verify the Golang such as uh, open and uh, other cases. Okay. And then, but it a lot of depends on chaos. So mm -hmm. when we run the cases. The, and we do chaos. After the chaos is uh, finished, and we mm -hmm. just verify the transaction is, is, is okay. Right, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. I still have a little problem, uh, question, question about the rapid MQ chaos. Uh, I, I think uh, the rapid MQ chaos, uh, uh, no. Uh, uh, for DNS chaos, uh, we make some modification on the DNS server, so it will hijacking the DNS request and make some chaos on it. But the yes. chaos experiment target is uh, a kind of application. Uh, so it's an application based on K uh, DNS, and then we break, uh, we broke the DNS, so we. Uh, so, so what, 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 what we need to test is the application. So I think the rapid MQ chaos, uh, uh, in, in my, uh, I understand that the rapid MQ chaos should also uh, test some other applications that are based on or uh, uh, depends on the rapid MQ. And we mm -hmm. broke, um, uh, broke the rapid MQ and see yes. uh, what application yes. or state mm -hmm. behavior. Uh, so, yeah. so I, I think, I think if we, if we really want to do this, I think, uh, uh, I, I don't know what can rapid MQ does because I, I don't know rapid, rapid MQ yeah. uh, API or uh, it's, uh, it will call some uh, internal API uh, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, do not do not send this message or uh, delay this message, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I think in our case we would be interested in more. Um, uh, how do you call it? What's the name for it? Uh, it's not critical, um, not really severe situations, uh, more dangerous situations, like which wouldn't be normal, such as, for example, as I mentioned, uh, what happens if the process that's responsible for replicating messages crashes? Mm -hmm. So if we can trigger Airline process crashes. Mm. Uh, we expect our internal algorithms to handle that nicely, and we expect there to not be any message loss. But what happens when you have, let's say, thousands of these, and different things crash at different times? Does the system still remain stable? What sort of mm. scenarios we would see that you know it's all random, right? It just happens randomly, um, and rather than making it more artificial, like this happens now and then, then, then that thing happens. We just throw some random chaos at it and we know exactly like what type of chaos events we have, but what we don't know is the order in which they happen. And I think that that makes some very interesting scenarios 
because things maybe they they would be deadlocked or something doesn't recover because we're waiting on something else. What would happen then? Uh, what happens, for example, if you have to load a lot of data from disk rather than from memory? How do you stream? All sorts of things. Because again, RabbitMQ, there's like so many parts to it, so complex. And there's not just one protocol, there's I think five or six or seven. So I think that's that's what make, would make this interesting. But I see your point in that it would be chaos, RabbitMQ chaos that other applications would use to see how they would behave, the clients, right? Yeah. So a lot of the client libraries that we, that we maintain, there are certain things which we expect them to handle nicely. Reconnecting, for example, so sometimes they they don't re, they don't always reconnect, and it's really difficult to catch that situation. They should, but depending on alarms, depending on synchronization, all sorts of weird things that, that tend to happen. So we have two more minutes. I would like to mention one more thing, and then I will hand over to whoever is going to close this. Thank you, Kale Smash, for making the CNCF ecosystem a better place. I really do think that you contribute to it in a positive way. So thank you for being part of it. Thank you for making it better. That's my last slide.